Of course, we could also talk about partial molar Gibbs free energy. So partial molar quantities um, can be a, a lot of different things. We've talked partial pressure very briefly, but that's an example I think you already know about. Um, partial molar volume and now partial molar Gibbs energy. Okay, so I'll remind you that the molar Gibbs energy is um, chemical potential. And similarly, I could also just say G equals mu times dn, right? So if we know that um, molar free energy, which is really G divided by dn, right? Then I just did some algebra here, okay? And so what that means then, my chemical potential, believe it or not, is a partial molar quantity. So just plain chemical potential of species J, whatever it is, water, ethanol, whatever you want, okay? So that is the partial of G with respect to the partial of the number of moles of species J. And of course, that's all that constant pressure, constant temperature, and assuming that the other component is that constant number of moles as well, okay? So, um, of course, then I could write the total differential for G in my mixture. If let's say I'm mixing um, A and B, back to just another simple example, okay? Mix A and B. Um, so then I'm gonna have now the partial free energy of A, which is the chemical potential of A, okay? At constant T, constant P, and constant NB, and then times D, and A, and then now that's going to be partial of G by partial moles of B, so the chemical potential of B. And that's at constant T, constant P, and constant N A, and this is of course going to be D and B, okay? Such that now I could write my Gibbs free energy at constant temperature and pressure equals just simply mu A N A plus mu b n b. So it reduces to that simple equation right there, which is what I see right here, okay? So free energy versus amount added. Um, and you can see that there, um, you know, in this example, this is showing you all like positive slopes. Um, but of course we could imagine situations, you know, in which the free energy has an effect where um, there's a negative slope, okay? And so the effect of that, of having a negative um, slope right there, that would actually tell us that there's a benefit to adding that particular species to this other species. So it would tell us a, there is a, a strong interaction between A and B if it's lowering the chemical potential. Of course, now in this figure here, as uh, B and A are being added together, if it's raising the chemical potential, um, of course, that tells us it would be non-spontaneous, right? Um, because we need to see Gibbs um, as a negative for spontaneous mixtures. So we're going to come back to this in a bit, talking about um, spontaneity in mixtures and forming solutions, okay? So, and now there's a really important equation that manifests if T and P are not constant. So if T and P are not constant, constant, we end up with a really important equation in thermodynamics. So this goes dg, and we have to remember the fundamental equation that happens when we combine the first and second law. And so that's going to go v dp minus s dt plus the sum of all chemical potentials of you know, species I, so the sum, like I, J, K, L, however many things are in our mixture, times the change in number of moles, okay? And so now this equation, I'm going to box this, and I'm going to call this the fundamental equation of chemical thermodynamics because there's just not a whole lot of chemistry we can do if we're not accounting for how the number of moles 
changes. So up to now, we were playing with this equation, dg equals vdp minus sdt, and that created our basis for phase equilibria. Well, when we actually add in this chemical potential and changing number of moles, that is what's going to create our basis for, for now for understanding the thermodynamics of mixtures, but also creates the basis for understanding what happens to dg with chemistry. Okay, so this is pretty cool. Um, so what do I have on the next slide? So there are other partial molar quantities that we have. Um, I didn't leave myself very much room to write, so I'm going to write them up here in the top. Um, so we could talk about um, all of these chemical potentials now could actually be given not just by G, but by the other quantities depending on what's being held constant. So for example, we could say the chemical potential of J is the partial of U by the partial of number of moles of J. And because this is U, we have to quick think, uh, quickly think about our thermo square, that UG ship. Um, we remember that U would be sandwiched between S and V. Okay, so if S and V are being held constant, my chemical potential is related to internal energy. So let me kind of box this off right here. Okay, so if my, if, um, let's see here, I could make a chemical potential out of enthalpy if I hold entropy and pressure constant, all right? Um, and I could make a chemical potential out of a partial molar quantity with the Helmholtz free energy if I hold T and V constant, okay? And so, um, and right, so here I've got now the partial molar quantity for Gibbs, okay? So we can talk about these um, chemical potentials, not just with respect to free energy, with Gibbs free energy, but we could talk about them with respect to the Helmholtz free energy, to the enthalpy, and the internal energy, depending on what we're holding constant, okay? So, but this is the one for chemists, DG, and that's because of the dependence of P, T, and number of moles, okay? So that is truly giving us the grand canonical ensemble, okay? So for those of you that go on to do um, thermo in grad school, you'll get into those ensembles. Um, remember, the canonical, the microcanonical, and the grand canonical, okay? So let's keep going, 